Thank you very much, Katka. Happy noon, Man Mary Olgera. Now me happy to mass look in you long up, long way through Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Long Hirimoto. Dina Namuna Kekeni Memero Ibonai Laumale Momo Kamu Noho Inseni Untuk Lecture. So I'm very happy. Thank you very much, Katka. This is a fantastic opportunity. <laughs> when we were here last year, and I realized that Cheske Budijovice has actually a group of Papuan people following your courses, and you have projects in New Guinea. I was overwhelmed. This is fantastic. I think it's the only place in Europe, actually in the world, where this happens. So congratulations for that. Uh, thank you very much for this chance to talk to you today. Uh, I realized what I have thought was uh, this course, uh, a master's in ecology, uh, is wrong. Uh, I took it from the internet. Sorry for that. So, you know? Yeah. To give you a little bit of background, I have an almost impossible task. When I thought about the topic, I thought about telling you about the dramatic change which is happening in New Guinea. And then also last night when we sat together and we talked, I realized how much ecology is going on here. So I've tried to put some ecology into my talk. This has inflated it and I have to race like crazy to be more or less in time. Uh, so give you a little bit of background. Uh, the Neolithic, sorry. The Neolithic revolution happened about 10,000 years ago. Uh, Homo sapiens about 200,000 years ago. 8,000 generations, that is 400 generations. The industrial revolution in Europe, eight, six generations ago. And the revolution for the Apo and other people in the highlands of New Guinea, especially in West New Guinea, because in East New Guinea, in Papua New Guinea, things went faster. The Australians have done more than the Dutch and later the Indonesians. So we have a bubble of prehistory in our modern world. This is amazing. Yeah. We always think that prehistory ended about 8,000 years when the Sumerian people were inventing writing and we have written records of history. That is not true for New Guinea. So you have still there uh, prehistoric techniques like making stone tools, and then came the plane. So it is a dramatic story of change. For the archeological background, Mayan's field, uh, we have many sites which are about 40,000. Also in the Bismarck archipelago, in New Britain, in New Ireland. This is very surprising because those early people came from Africa and they stayed in the hot area, so they contained, they kept their black skin and their curly hair, and they arrived <laughs> in the Sahul shells, connected Australia and New Guinea at that time, in the time when the sea level was 120 meters lower because of ice age, but they very quickly went on to the east. So the oldest archeological sites are about 44 and uh, something like that, in Australia, possibly 60,000 years ago. So how did this happen? How did the guys make it across these uh, sea channels? Those lines here are channels, also in prehistory. This is the Wallace Strait separating Bali and Lombok. You probably know about that. From here on west, you have the placenta animals. From here on east, you have the marsupial animals with the pouch. So that's the situation about uh, the uh, archaeology. And what you see is this is our area, where I will talk about mainly. And in the west of New Guinea, we have very little archaeology. 
So we thought that there would be a wonderful place for Mayan and her team to work. Here, uh, very quickly, as you know, I don't have to tell you, uh, Melanesia is a paradise for all kinds of research. Uh, the uh, Papuan people arrived around that time. Austronesians came about 4,000. And here is a dictionary of the Apo language. I have given the tribe the name Mek because all of the people who live here and who call water and river Mek belong to one culture. Uh, where's the Ok guy uh, over there? You say Ok to river and water. I borrowed that idea to classify the group of languages which are around north and east of the central range. So you are my role model. And if that had been done in New Guinea, we would have a wonderful classification, Ok, Mek, Ik, Yi, and so on. Yeah. We haven't done that because missionaries have invented all kinds of crazy names, and these are in the literature, and now we have to fight with them. But here we have a real name of their real language, so it's the Mek cultures. And I have, together with a friend, written the dictionary of their language. There was no written record, of course, 13,000 words. The language is much richer, but that was one of my uh, contributions to, uh, to honor this culture. Ecology. This is a graph showing the richest biodiversity around the globe, the red colors. And the interesting thing is that the richest cultural areas in the world are around in the same area. So New Guinea, Melanesia, a thousand or more languages and cultures, other areas, Amazonia. Why this connection is, is a very interesting question. I'm not going to try and answer this now, but you see here, <clears throat> this uh, is Highland New Guinea, where we work, Mek. This is the Trobian Islands, uh, and here are the uh, Yanomami, and here are the Himba and the Kalahari Sun. These are the five groups we have been concentrating on in our institute, Max Planck Institute uh, in Seewiesen, founded by Konrad Lorenz, an ornithologist, medical person like myself, and biologist. His student was Ireneus Eibel Eibersfeld, and he started our human ethology discipline. And we have an archive of 300 kilometers of film from those five cultures, which hopefully will be one day world heritage. Very briefly on an interesting aspect of genetics. This is Denisova cave in the mountains south of Novosibirsk in the Altai mountains. And those guys, as you may know, form either a subline of Homo sapiens, the Russians call it Homo sapiens altaiensis, and I think it's correct to classify them as a subspecies. They went from this area to China, to Southeastern Asia, and to New Guinea. Their genes are in the guys who, whom we have here. You have 5% Zenithova genes, in Europe, we have about 1% or less. So this is a very interesting aspect. How did it happen? Where did the Denisovans meet the black guys who are now the Papuans? We don't know that. Some people think the Denisovans even went into Melanesia, but that is not yet uh, really decided. That is a map of New Guinea and the surrounding islands. And you see the circles where I have done my major work. Uh, 1965, I arrived in Port Mosby. We worked in the Gulf of Papua. We worked in Central Province near Berena, Yule Island. We went to Mount Posabi. We worked on the Trobin Islands. I worked in the area of Wiwek, Northern Sipic, mainly for genetic work and in the Milne Bay area, Misima uh, and the islands here. Uh, Mayan and I have worked on Biak in Merauke on the south coast of West New Guinea. And this is the area of my main research, the Epo area. New Guinea was 
what happened there? No, sir. That's the shape of a bird, of an ancient bird, the island. And that I find so wonderful because it is, it is really symbolic. New Guinea is the island of the most spectacular birds, okay, thanks, of the most spectacular words, uh, birds in the world, the birds of paradise, and the bower birds, who are the only birds who produce art. The male produces a picture of fruits and other things of one color or several colors to lure the females to come to his bower to be uh, to have copulation with him. So they are the only birds who produce art like us. And we find their pictures wonderful. Perhaps they find our pictures also wonderful if they see that. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, New Guinea is an island of the birds. I've published a little paper about the birds in the food of the Apo culture. Uh, of course, also wonderful butterflies. Um, our home in New Guinea, Papilio Argeus. That is me in 1966, playing the mouth organ to my friends who came with me to the summit of the crater of Mount Pusavi. Maybe some of you know, it is now a natural park. It is known for its biodiversity. Attenborough in the BBC channel made a film about uh, Pusavi. So in 1966, uh, we were there and I did my doctoral dissertation in ethnomedicine about the traditional beliefs and practices regarding to health in that area, the uh, Kaluli and the Varagu people. So my first contact to New Guinea was in 1965-66. I was a medical student and I studied the traditional medical system in some of the areas. So from there, ethnomedicine, I became an ethnologist, anthropologist, and uh, I became a kind of linguist else also. So you can imagine since 1965, my ties go back to New Guinea. Uh, it's really my second home. Uh, that is a, a journal I've co-founded this is one of the healers from the central province area. His name is uh, Kwai Rabao, a very impressive person who took care of the patients. And here is a picture of uh, a healing ceremony. This is a man who was wounded in the war and uh, his comrades are trying to drive the spirits away to make him healthy again. As I mentioned, we have worked in on the Trowind Islands, who are at that time, 1979 and onwards, we're still using traditional canoes with pandanus leaf sails. With these outrigger canoes, the Pacific was conquered. When Cook came, all the islands were occupied already. This is the most awesome uh, expansion of expansion of humans everywhere the settling of the Pacific. As you may know, the Trovan Islanders are used, are known for their very pronounced sense of aesthetics, very highly ritualized culture. This is the launching of a seagoing Kula canoe with the Kula canoes. They go around the islands trading uh, items which are not really economically important, but ritually socially important. They also have a very interesting system. After the harvest, they put up their yield from their gardens per family in large cones. And they have a clever method of defining the volume of these cones by taking measure of the circumference and because they all have the same angle, they have a, a kind of algorithm to decide how many baskets of yams are in that cone. And then these yams are filled into special houses. They are called liku, and they are the storage houses of the leading men of the society. The Trovian society 
is very interested in many ways. It's an Austronesian society, like other societies in New Guinea. Uh, the children are counted into the clan, into the family of the mother. On the other hand, there are some patrilineal uh, aspects of the society. Heritage of land, for instance, goes in the male line. Uh, and and uh, the chiefs have a very high status in contrast to the political system of the Highland guys, where you have a meritocracy, the big men, as we call them, they are there because they are convincing the others that they are able to lead the community. When they get sick or their mind is not sharp anymore, then they have to go. So it's no hereditary chieftainship like in the Austronesian societies. Uh, Malinowski described that Trobrian society in many books. The most famous one is 1929, The Sexual Life of Savages. Ugh, can you imagine how these guys have sex, how wild and so on? It's not very convincing and tempting, that book. And he, he makes some fundamental mistakes. He says the Trobrianders do not know that intercourse leads to pregnancy. Imagine, imagine. The Trobrianists are breeding pigs. They castrate the male pigs. They know exactly what the testes are for and the penis. It is so crazy that an intelligent man like that, up to his deathbed, had this idea. He did not give up that idea. It's completely foolish. Yeah. Humans are extremely clever. I will show you in a minute. So the Trobrianers know exactly well, without sex, there is no pregnancy. They also believe that the growth of the baby in the womb of the woman is because a spirit of somebody who died, called Baloma, enters the woman. That is a secondary necessary uh, cause for pregnancy, but they know exactly what. So Malinowski was trying to portray a society which was completely different than our own. Free sex, which is not true. Uh, the, no, no knowledge about pregnancy, which is not true. Um, and also the way he described the gifts of the harvest within the families was found by Nina Bell Kranals, my colleague and myself, to be wrong. The main harvest gifts go either to the father or to the elder brother. And they are the ones who are likely to be helpful for you in your further life. The family of his sister and his sister's husband and the other matrilines, like mother sister, receive very few harvest gifts. So we have been able to correct that. To give you a, a little overview about the MEG area, that this is the central range, which as you know, divides New Guinea like a backbone for 1,500 kilometers from the bird's head. You see, this is the bird's head and the whole body of the bird, and that's the bird's tail. And here we have the Mech, the Epo Mech, the central village of the people where we were, and all these villages on the southern and the northern side belong to the Mech, and here you have the ox. Uh, you come from somewhere here, uh, across the border. That's uh, the 141st degree eastern longitude. Uh, Tefalmin, uh, Mianmin people are about here, and you belong to the Ok. Here are the Yali, which are a Yali, Yali Dani group, and then it goes on. So here is the big river, uh, the Sokke, which becomes the Mamberamo. Uh, the, the biggest river in, in Western New Guinea. Highland people, they were unknown until 1959, when a group of French journalists crossed West New Guinea from the South Coast across our valley to the North Coast. It was a, an epic expedition. A couple of people died, very tough. This is how the Epo look like. Baba Signa, one of my friends, on the way to become a big man, powerful guy, physically vital, 
intelligent, socially competent. They have the peace good, uh, as many Highland cultures, a very interesting piece of dress, not very comfortable, by the way. Uh, it's always in the way when you are doing something, uh, but they think it's, it's the proper way for a man to dress. Um, we could talk about the evolutionary psychological significance a lot about this. Um, erection in primates is not only the consequence of sexual arousal, erotics, if you want, but of dominance. So we could call this frozen erection is a sign of male dominance. And that would fit those Highland cultures very well. They were very aggressive, very martial. This is one of the women, Bob Young, with her firstborn child. Uh, this wonderful Billum here. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you see the baby is very well fed. They were breastfed for two or more years. There was a child spacing of about three years. Menarche was about 17. Mayan and I have a student who did a study. It is now a bit over 12. Can you imagine? Five years in about 35 years due to the change in diet. Menarche is an opportunistic system in the female reproductive system. If life is good, food is good, you overlay it early because you have time only up to about 42 or so. So that is what they have experienced. And now we have families who have 11 children who survive. So we have an explosion of population. It's one of the problems. The life of women, getting the food from the gardens, taking care of the pig. Interestingly, as you know, the pigs in New Guinea are our pig, Sus Grufa. They are not the Balinese type pig or other type pigs which are in Vietnam, etc. Very crazy why that pig is in New Guinea. Not known so far. Until today, uh, the Meg people are Stone Age technologists because they are napping stones to make stone axes. Of course, today they have steel axes and bush knives, but this, the stone axe is still an important kind of payment for certain things, bright price, etc. So it is still going on. And Mayan and I hope that we will be able soon to document this technology, which I think is the only place in the world where people make stone axes. Fantastic technology, undersea stone, a uh, volcanic kind of stone. This is how the village of Mongona looked like in 1975. We uh, were five people walking. <clears throat> it took us five days and Three of those in the team were completely kaput, as we say in German. They were not used to walking in the mountains. Uh, so they, they were really uh, uh, flat out. And two of them left very quickly back to Germany, came back much later when I had finished the airstrip and so on. So it was a little bit a difficult start. That was my house here. And my toilet, I had a plastic roof for my important things like the generator and, and, and the battery. I didn't want it to get wet. And that is the village. Two men's houses, circular shape, very symbolic, shielding you as a center of culture against the nature, the wilderness, the dangerous world. Here is in the trees, the women's house, so we have men's house and women, women's house showing the cultural dimorphism of these Highland groups. Male world and female world are seen to be fundamentally different. They're also perceived to be absolutely vital, both of them, for the survival of humans, for the survival of culture, for the survival of cosmos. So there is equality of male and female, but there are different fields of life. In a day, everyday situation, you don't see that so much. You don't feel it much. They work together. They laugh together. It is a very 
well-functioning society from our point of view. This is how it looks today, imagine. My first airstrip was here at this ridge. In 1976, in June 26, a very big earthquake happened, 7.2 on Richter scale, and a lot of the mountains came down and they covered my airstrip. Then the mission, Canadian mission, built the second airstrip. And then some years ago, the airport decided they built it by hand. You see, no machines, no dynamite. Ours, we had six spades and two crowbars. And then they said, we need a big airstrip. We don't want to be Düsseldorf, we want to be Frankfurt. We want the big airplanes to come. So they built this airstrip now, which is now asphalted. It's more than 500 meters long, has a nice incline, so you can have bigger planes now. It's amazing how quickly those people from Stone Age understood the modern world. You need to be a hub. You need to be a center. The economical stuff are going on there, and that is what they wanted. Here uh, is the center, the cultural center, which I have been able to build with German and Indonesian money. This is pretty much where my house was before, and the men's house. Here is the hospital. Here are the schools. Uh, down here somewhere is the big church here. Uh, and, and we have now about five times more people than we had before. And I'm often talking with them about this. I say, how do you think you can feed your children? You cannot make gardens in the sky. They say, yes, we know that. Uh, we are getting rice from the government. This is an important part. But we have already made arrangements with our friends lower down, where life was dangerous before because you had a lot of malaria. The malaria line is about 1,600 meters. Above that, you did not have endemic malaria. And now with modern medicine, they know they can survive lower down and they are thinking of making their gardens there. So this is one of the tricks, but they also have one very interesting answer. That was jumping back again in 1974, in June, when we prepared our walk to Epomec. When we built the airstrip, we had big rocks. We had to destroy them with fire and with force. And that is the old airstrip uh, in July 75, it was opened and we had contact to the outside world. And then our project would start. We had 32 scientists in the field, botany, zoology, ethnomusicology, physical anthropology, and so on and so on. And, and that was a pretty successful uh, uh, program until 1976, the Indonesians did not prolong our visa. Indonesians have always been very reluctant uh, with us because, as you may know, in West New Guinea, there's an independence movement. And, and of course, the government thinks we Westerners, we, we back the local people. We, we think the independence for them is the best. I personally think it would be a very bad idea uh, because Papua New Guinea on the other side is in real trouble because there is no strong government. Uh, so, but that is a different question. Maybe later with a couple of beer, we can talk about those kind of things. Uh, recently, uh, they said we want our airstrip to be asphalted. So the government said, okay, prepare 300 cubic meters of stones and 300 cubic meters of sand. Then we send a team to make the asphalt. A few weeks later, everything was ready. Now the asphalt is there. We work very closely together, like you do, with the local people. This is Valabian, one of my best co-workers, extremely intelligent man. Imagine, uh, some years ago, he said to me, you know what? I have observed that we have some plants which are coming up from the lowland. They're now flowering in our place. They did not do that before. I think it's getting warmer. So, global warming understood by a ne neolithic mind yeah he is he is writing down his whole his own history very neatly he had about two years of school 
in the, an intellectual, a real intellectual, driven by the urge to know. And he was one of those who taught me their language and their culture. Unfortunately, he died. Uh, this is from a book of one of the most knowledgeable people about, as it was called before, Irian Jaya, uh, Mitten, uh, Bob Mitten. He knew all New Guinea at both sides of the border. And he writes very nice words about our project. He says, I've never met more friendly people in New Guinea than they are. Maybe he should have come to your place and he would have written the same. Uh, my own children have been there uh, in 1980, my son as well. Uh, something you may probably know in this group, <clears throat> We have a number of centers of domestication of plants in the world. China for rice, maybe sorghum, <clears throat> Mesopotamia for wheat, dinkle, emma, etc. <clears throat> the Amerindian people, the most successful in the world for potatoes, sweet potato, tomato, tobacco, and so on and so on, and the llamas and alpacas, etc. <clears throat> but Highland New Guinea has been one of the centers of domestication, <clears throat> especially for two plants, <clears throat> Colocasia esculenta, taro, which is an important food plant in the world. In Highland New Guinea, you have three species uh, of Saharum. Saharum spontaneum, Saharum officinarum, which is the sugar cane, which does not come from Cuba, as we may think. It comes from Highland New Guinea. And the local people have bred a hybrid, and that is Saharum edule, which we here don't know. It's called Pit Pit Long Topisi. Yeah. Mekupela Kai Kai Tru. Tastes wonderful, much better than asparagus for me. Uh, it could be a, a success in the world, perhaps. So far, nobody has tried to grow it anywhere else. So those two plants, plus others, are the product of the farming mind of Papuan people. You can be very proud about that. Europe, zero. Maybe apples. <laughs> <laughs> Knowledge. In our team, <clears throat> we had two botany professors. And they collected plants, of course. And they were accompanied by the juveniles who did not have so much work to do like the adults. And they said, what are you doing there? Uh, well, we are collecting the plants because we want to study them and find out what grows in your area. Oh, good. Do you know that this plant is the brother of this plant? No, not really. And, and how do you think so? They are so different because we know it. The two guys went home to Berlin. They took the Herba ex exemplaris from Key, uh, Kew Gardens in London, from Leiden in Holland, from Bogor in Indonesia. What turned out? Not only the same family, Saxifraga cee, but the same genus, Pitturus. This has happened in about 15 cases. When the local people said these plants are related, and in the Linnaean sense, from our perspective, imagine, Carolus Linnaeus from Uppsala in Sweden, yeah? and the guys in New Guinea, 15,000 kilometers away. How come? How come they have this extraordinary, detailed, precise knowledge? Because the human brain is the same all over the world. We in Europe had taxonomy, which was pre-Linnaean, but similar. We call the red beech and the white beech and so on. So we had a hierarchical system and a genealogy. And that is what those guys have. And they know these things so precisely. Even the children know. Imagine our schools. The teacher spends an hour trying to explain them the difference between the pine trees in our forests. Fish, the kiefer, tanne, etc. Children go to the forest, no idea. That's the difference. When you learn in a context and you learn these things uh, so extremely well. With regard to medicine, 
I had patients who had this kind of exanthema. When it were, was worse, it was that I had no idea what it was. I thought it was a Staun's exanthema because it was uh, below the strings of the grass skirts. An old woman comes and says, hey, Deriplop, I think you don't know about this disease because when you give us medicine, it doesn't get better. And the other diseases you treat, you are very successful. I say, yes. She says, this is from the pigs. And I said, hey, my mother, are you sure? I am sure, I tell you. So I went home, I checked the literature. <clears throat> In Europe, we had scabies transmitted from pigs to human. And that's the case. I took some histology, sarcoptes scabie. Yeah. So it is amazing how detailed their scientific knowledge can be. <clears throat> One of my topics is human birth. What we do in Europe is pretty ridiculous. The supine position lying on your back is the second worst after the headstand for birth. <laughs> uh, we, should, we should learn. We should learn. Uh, I can talk hours about it. I won't, I'm not going to do that. It's amazing to see how these children are born. Nobody pulls them out. You know, the movement of the baby, like this, then like this, and then come the shoulders, three times turn, everything is done by itself. We don't have to intervene. We believe technology is making this difficult situation of birth more safe. It is not. In many cases, it's making it worse. This is my statement. You can imagine I'm not very popular with some of the doctors. <laughs> Food. A lot of insect food, very little animal protein. Insect food, especially for the women and the children, not for the men. The women need it for menstruation, for lactation. The children need it to grow. Uh, this is for everyone, falanga, couscous, as you may know. Little small marsupials are caught in the high mountains. And these are the traps. Maybe, uh, don't know about the off guy, maybe you have similar ones. You have a stem, a young stem, which is very elastic. You bend it down. This is your force, which pulls the trap together. And then you have a in very intelligent system. This is the releaser stick. And for me, the most impressive thing is that every item has a technical name. Like in the car engine, you have the piston, the piston ring, the crankshaft, etc., etc. Everything has a name. So those guys have a mental cognitive concept, which is very technological. Like an engineer would design a thing like that. The highlands up in the mountains above the tree line, 3,600 meters about, amazing country. Well, this is our group together with two of my children when they were already bigger. Uh, this is the calcite dome of the Ablim, 4,500 meters. Awesomely wonderful, wonderful place. Cycas growing there. The dog is another enigma. Why do we have the dog there? The dog is not a marsupial. The dog has been imported. We don't know when. Maybe the Austronesians did that. Um, anyway, there is a particular form of the dog which traditionally could not bark. They were howling. That is why the early zoologists called him the New Guinea singing dog. When we arrived in 74, the dogs could not bark. They have learned it now from dogs which came from the coast. So Tanis familiaris halströmi is that dog. And they lived wild in the high mountains and, and uh, eat those small marsupials there. Warfare was a very prominent part of their life. For 11 months, in the 17 months I stayed with them in the beginning, uh, was war. <clears throat> uh, typical for New Guinea societies uh, between groups who are often quite close to each other. Uh, the, the men wear a cuirass made of tandan, of rattan, you know, the things our chairs are made from, 
it's a very good protection. Uh, the oak have the same. I don't know whether you have ever seen one of those things, uh, cuirasses. We call them ting. Mm. You in the oak have, uh, do you have that decoration for men which is hanging from the head down on the back? And you call it mafum? Yes. Yeah, we call it moon. No, we have seals, not, not this. Dressed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ours, ours looks like this. Yours are, is bigger, rounder, I think, right? Uh, yes, bigger and flat. Yeah. So you can hold it like this. Yeah, yeah. And, and you see, those words are the same in our two cultures. Yeah. But the others are quite different. So it's, it's a really different culture. The question is, where did the people in the highlands come from? From west or from east? And there is one reason to believe that east-west was the main movement. And those things, um, like mafum to moon, linguistically tell us that was the direction. You cannot come from moon to mafum because the, the phoneme mafum is changed, simplified, and that is the direction which has happened and not the other way around. So very interesting questions to be answered. Here is one of the warriors who had six arrows in his body and I carried him to the village. He survived, that's a little bit later. That was the big earthquake in 1976. Devastating. The local people were very clever. They realized that there was a danger that the mountains would come down. So they fled on round hills. Very few died here. In other areas, very many people died. This was a kind of turnaround in their history. Their religious objects disappeared. And that is when a little bit later, they started to think, let's change our religion. Let's change our culture. We live in a bubble outside the world, but we belong to one. We want to belong to the world. So let's accept Christianity. It was not like one, one, one was baptized by the missionary. At one stage, everyone went to the ponds and everybody got water over his head. And that was it. And, and they have now fared rather well. I'm saying that as an atheist. So uh, religion is not my favorite <laughs> subject, but I think it was a clever way for them to do. One of the advantages is that one of the missionaries made a pond, a fishing pond, for Chinese carp and for tilapia. The local people realized how clever this is. The, bio the biomass in that area, six meters of rainfall per year, and a lot of growth is so big, you don't need to feed the fish. They grow by themselves up to that size. So this is what they're doing now. And this is counteracting the population growth and the need for good food. They never had so much protein like they have now. When you die, like here, a young woman, you are put up in a tree and then comes a second stage of funeral. And then in the last stage, your skull is put somewhere in a sacred place. All this has completely changed now. We may deplore this as white people, we're always romantic. We want these children of nature to stay as they are. Uh, human history has been a history of change and we have to accept that. This was uh, one of their men's houses and the most sacred relic transferred into the newly constructed men's house. This is a young man in a religious ceremony, initiation ceremony, getting his first penis cord and the belt. That is from the Ok. It's called Yolam. I don't know whether you know that word for the men's house. Uh, so the Epo have the same institution, but we don't have these wonderful shields. But the similarity of the two cultures is rather there. In about 1982, yeah, 1982, one of the leading men gave this little string bag to me, and he said, it contains two stones. They are important for our history, for our religion. Humans came from these stones. We have now become Christian. I think all these things will get lost. I want to give it to you to keep it in your 
institute in your museums because there you are keeping those things. So you see this trust, I want to, uh, to stress, we are now discussing that we have to give back many, many things like uh, sacred things from Australian Aborigines, etc., Africa. And that is the proper thing to do at the present time. But you also have the other side where local people are afraid that their culture will get lost and they give it to us. So we have a great res responsibility here. Uh, life of the Ebo uh, was very healthy. Disease-wise, they had infectious diseases, yes. Bronchitis, pneumonia, ulcus topicum. Most uh, in, uh, diseases came by infection. All the rest was wonderful. No stroke, no heart attack, no obesity, no diabetes. Perfect bodies like these women here, like that man here. These were the BMIs, around 20. Cannot be much better. The women were extremely powerful, carrying their own body weight, 40 kilograms of garden produce and firewood for an hour or more up and down the hills with a smile on their lips. Not Venus Williams, testosterone <laughs> muscles. Graysile women, all technology. Children playing wild stuff, also the girls in the rivers. No parent comes and says, hey, hey, that's too dangerous. Don't do that. Children are exposed to this world and it's really a, a lovely childhood they have. The problem is when those people are exposed to our culture, like this wonderful la lady, a very good friend, she was adopted by one of our team as a baby. She was exposed to Western food. All her family in Germany is slim. So she loves Augustina beer, as you see here. And that is one of the problems. Uh, people from the Pacific, when they eat McDonald's food, etc., they become very quickly very obese. And there's a very interesting theory why that is the case. The theory is that your body is more able to survive on low protein and low calorie than ours. And when you come to a high calorie world, then that's the catastrophe. This is the team of Mayan and myself in Indonesia. Uh, you saw that picture already. One of the topics is the bilum. The bilum is uniting East and West New Guinea. It is a tradition of the women probably thousands of years old. It's the exquisite work of women. It is their pride, their currency, a sign of friendship, and it needs to become UNESCO World Heritage. The problem is that East and West New Guinea are politically pretty much enemies. Indonesians don't like PNG. PNG wants to swallow West Papua. So we have that problem. I hope we'll overcome that and these wonderful things could become a world heritage. It would really be a, a wonderful move. This is Monica Malo. She was uh, in Germany a couple of months ago with her husband and her daughter, who has Mayan's name, by the way. And, and she, did, she demonstrated uh, for a film the making of a string. So we have done some archaeology here. Nicola Antunes, Marianne, local people were very interested. And what came out was 2,150 plus minus 30 years before present. We were very disappointed, but we already knew that layer of culture of ash, cabo, uh, burned, burned wood was about 15 centimeters. Yeah. We should have had two meters or so. And then we said to the local people, look, we have found 2,000 years your ancestors made fire here. That's not very much. Hey, what do you say? Our fathers made fire here before Jesus, Jesus was born. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> for them, it was a success. For us, it is uh, a little bit disappointing. <laughs> Ethnoarchaeology, we are studying their technologies. We are looking at the languages. This is one of the uh, interesting things with regard to you here. There is a theory out there in the world that ecology 
predisposes groups of people to have certain specific cultures and languages. This sounds logical. Yeah, The Inuit in Greenland live in an Arctic environment and, and they have a particular culture and they, their language is also somehow shaped by their environment. This may be true for some very uh, extreme ecologies. In New Guinea, we found it is not the case. Nicola Antunes is a great modeler. He uh, modeled the, all the ecological data available, temperature, rainfall, days of sunshine, um, the growth uh, period in the year, et cetera, et cetera, the geology, and found that this is not predisposing a specific language or culture groups. In the highlands of New Guinea, you have the same ecology all over the place. This is the mega. And there are hundreds still today, hundreds, hundreds of ethnic groups who speak different languages. So that ecology is the same, but the cultures are different. <laughs> From our human ethological point of view, the main driver of cultural diversification is not the environment, but the insight biopsychology of humans and of groups. We have the system of ethnicity. We are the real people. The neighbors are somebody else, the barbaroi, uh, from the Greek point of view. We feel solidarity. We have an enemyship or some disgust even of other groups outside. It's not very nice to say that, but I think this is what happens. Ericsson, uh, coined the word pseudo-speciation. So cultures are undergoing a process of speciation like biology, like in biology, and that is why we have this enormous variety of cultures. It's not the environment, basically, but the inner biopsychology of groups. But Ateng, Nazarius, we talked about that yesterday, uh, and actually Mayan and I hope that perhaps your group can help us uh, in, in finding them. These belong to the oldest jewels in the world. 100,000 years before, South Africa had these kind of beads. This is how they are found in the sea. This lady from Biak helped us here, sorry, uh, helped us to, to find them. So Biak may be the place where they come from. This is Kauri, I think, Mayan. yeah. And this is a Nazarius, so a very interesting piece of, of jewelry. Uh, this is uh, the question why the groups are so different. This is the work of Petre Kain, and he showed that in different groups in Highland New Guinea, West New Guinea, the different groups have different body decoration. The same is true in Germany, in Czechia. Each valley had a different kind of tradition for dress, for song, etc. Yeah, a few theoretical issues. Can a population be thrown a few thousand years into a new world? Maori Kiki, one of your famous uh, politicians in New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, wrote a book called 10,000 Years in a Lifetime. That is a very good title. Yeah. Is that possible or do we have to worry? We don't have to worry. People are doing very well. Apo have been in Germany. Apo are using the airplane like a taxi. There's no road. You have either to walk or to fly. So they have, that was their traditional life. They have changed it fundamentally, but many parts are still the same. They are still living mainly on the, of their gardens. Their social life is the same. Uh, their political uh, structure is changing. You have now elected persons. This is the school, the elementary school. That was uh, many years ago. Now you, we have a uh, high school. Uh, first step, uh, it's called the Sekola Meninga Pratama. That is the first uh, junior high school. And then um, Sekola Meninga Atas, that is the uh, upper high school up to university. And a number of these are the children. Education is the new goal in life. 
parents are very proud if their child succeeds in school and in university. So about 50 students have received their degrees in university. This is the university in Jayapura, where I sometimes give lectures, and some of the guys sitting there are from our tribe, and I find that is wonderful. We have shown them the films of the past. They are very interested in their own history because they know it's changing so fast. This is the cultural center. I mentioned already uh, some pictures inside. Yeah, so uh, there are, of course, problems because um, uh, the overpopulation, uh, the um, shortage of garden land, and especially new diseases. Tuberculosis was not there. HIV AIDS was not there. Measles and a number of virus diseases were not there. Malaria was not there. Uh, so now they have to grapple with that. And it's very difficult for them to understand that viruses are calling disease and not magic. So in Papua New Guinea, we have that same problem. People are burned as witches uh, because uh, they are accused of causing disease. Uh, so um, they are having a tremendous job in front of us, but I think they will be able to handle that. Thank you, Drew. Thank you very much.